because they didn't want to be the jury that convicted, uh, you know, two white men killing a black man, man, uh, for assaulting a white woman. Right. And, you know, there was a, and I suppose one reason the citizens council may have been a little bit worried is if, uh, because even though there was all the local pressure to acquit, there was this national and international pressure to convict because I think people wanted to see some justice in the South. People had been very critical of Southern way of life and the lynching era and all that stuff. But the local pressure to acquit won out because that's where they had to live and be and interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis. So because it had, the case had received international coverage, I could see why the citizens councils might have thought this time it may not work in our favor because the prosecution was, you know, Gerald Chatham and uh, Robert Smith were trying hard to prosecute. And you could say it was because it was such an, a case of uh, getting so much attention and the judge was acting, you know, Judge Swangle was known to be a fair judge. It was the defense and the jury that was came down to, you know, being the, the defense did some unethical things. I think by them not laying out the argument in the trial that the body wasn't Emmett Till and the body was planted or that Emmett Till was still alive, where that could all be done, you know, dealt with under cross-examination. They waited till closing arguments. I mean, uh, Sheriff Strider talked about that, but uh, uh, nobody else had a chance to really uh, talk about it or get cross-examined about it. And they wait till, but but what the one thing he didn't, the only thing Sheriff Strider said is that he didn't know that that he couldn't tell that body was Emmett Till. I didn't know who Emmett Till was. Uh, we have had reports of another murder, but as far as all the stuff about it being a hoax, Emmett Till being alive, uh, the body being planted in the river, the defense didn't bring that up during testimony. They only brought it up during closing arguments. And I and I'm not an attorney, so I didn't know if that was if if that was something that could could ethically do. And I talked to a defense attorney when I did my book and he said, no, if that wasn't brought up during testimony, they shouldn't have brought it up then because there had been no chance to cross examine and refute it. Right. So the defense did stuff like that. And the jury was, was prejudiced. So it boiled down to unethical defense and a racist jury. And that wasn't going to change no matter what. I don't think. Yeah. So later on, over the years, uh, there's there's been a lot of a lot of rumors and things like that. Just just some of it just utter complete nonsense uh, about what happened to Emmett Till. Because um, there's so many holes and speculations and such. Can, not that we need to go through every single one, but some of the more popular uh, rumors, like he was castrated and these sort of things. Yeah, that's one and and I just to me you know as a historian I just think the facts matter if they're small facts big facts if they don't make a difference um, you know I still think you have to get the story right and then go from there and, and one of the things that there was a rumor I'm not sure if when the rumor started that he was castrated but it's been it was revived I guess uh, in the 2000s uh, one of the documentaries about Emmett Till interviews someone and, and when you're interviewing someone for a documentary and they're thinking back on things they remembered decades earlier, it's just naturally they're going to get things wrong. They're not there with documents. It's different than, you know, documentary in that sense with that relies on memory is so different than what a historian would do relying on documents that were created, you know, good primary documents that were created at the time so you can measure when someone forgets or when the story changes or when there's conflicts. In this documentary, someone said that Moses Wright told him that Emmett's, Emmett had been castrated. And I remember every time I've heard, seen that movie in a, in a group setting, people gasp. And I always want to say it's not true. And, and the reason we know it wasn't true is because Emmett's mother was the first one to say on the witness stand that she examined him from head to toe and he was uh, intact. Mm -hmm. And she said that in interviews since. And also when they performed an autopsy on him in 2005, they, you know, one of the things they said was his body was actually in better shape when in 2005 than it was in 
1955 because the, the, the Emmett Till body that we saw in those photographs was still bloated from having been in the river. And he was in a very airtight casket because they had that thick glass that they had placed over his body so that people filing by wouldn't touch him or maybe smell him as well. So that kept the casket sealed really well. And so his, he was in pristine condition other than the effects of the beating and being in the river. His body hadn't decomposed any further. And his genitals were intact. And the, the FBI investigator told me that there's a photograph of someone with a latex glove just being very clear, holding those genitals up and, photo, and they photographed him for the autopsy. He was not castrated. But that rumor has persisted because someone said it in a documentary and that was not carefully edited out like I think it should have been. And so that's, that's one. Yeah, well, and, and, and the castration part would, would fit the narrative to begin with because that was a common thing that would take place when, when African-Americans right. were lynched. Right, and so that would have yeah, uh, lent some, you know, people would have assumed that was a true, a credible story because, uh, you know, of how people viewed black men as rapists and they would castrate them. So, but, 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 but I think the important thing to this in particular is, is that this refutes the idea that he was a man, right? Because if he was a, you know, which yeah. he was, just, he had just turned 14. He was only a month into being 14. Yeah. That, that thus, the, you know, he really clearly wasn't the threat that a man would be, uh, you know. Uh, so why well, castrate a boy? Right? Yeah, I think had these men thought they were going after someone who'd been accused of rape, they would have castrated him. And so that tells me that the, when they, when Moses Wright said that, that when they came to kidnap him, that they said, we want the boy that did that talk, that that's all he had been accused of was talk. And so that, that it was only talk that set these men off to do what they did. I mean, they didn't have a right to say, we want the boy who grabbed my wife. We want the boy who, you know, who said all, you know, who, you know, grabbed her wrist and grabbed her by the waist and, None of that took place. Yeah, so they were set off by a very minor, minor infraction, mm. and that's what led them to kill. Right. So I think it's important to know that because it shows how easily, how a, a black man had to live in fear over the smallest thing because that wouldn't have been unusual for them to think that if they talked to a woman, if they looked, you know, it, uh, Wheeler Parker talked about, you know, you know, he, his mother warned him not to have a wandering eyeball, which means, you know, if you just looked for a second or then, then turned away, that would have set somebody off. So you didn't have to be accused of rape. You only had to be accused of talking, looking, not saying ma'am, and people would have thought that was disrespectful. And, it, you know, so that's important, I think, to, to point out. I mean, LaVon, you actually say, I, I believe it's in an ordinary hero that, you didn't even want to be in the same room as a white woman because you just never knew what might set her off. Right. And then you'd, you'd just be the obvious, you know, target. Yeah. There's been one of the reasons, problems I've had to this day, and, and I'm, I'm much better than I used to be, was a lot of the, 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 uh, the men who were accused of rape. And I had problems because I grew up in a society where that is the first thing they would say that you raped a white woman. And that meant you were gonna die one way or another. Uh, and today it doesn't mean that, but it took me a while to get used to the fact that people do that and it doesn't matter whether they're white or black, that that could happen. Because I was brought up afraid and the, my definition of rape was to touch the white woman. You don't have to do anything, but you touched her. And, when you grew up in the South, you knew better than that. And you knew better than to look at them funny. Or if they were accused of wanting you, then it was your fault. That could get you killed. So there were a lot of things that, uh, that were brought up in the Emmett Till case because that's the way people thought anyway. So and she that's why so many parents were, were, upset, were uh, nervous about their sons. So Levon, so you're saying even if, so let's say if a white woman, you know, was getting sweet on you, that they could be like, oh wait a second, clearly, you know, 
you're you know you're the one who needs to be uh, put in your right. place again. Right. Now she might get beat up, but you are the one who's going to die. Right. So this explains why uh, when you first met my mom, she wanted to go for walks and stuff, and I like I don't got time. For, I don't, you know I don't, I don't want to do that. Right. We can, <laughs> we can go on demonstrations together, but we don't go on anywhere else. Right. No, but that's why. Yeah. Uh, and it took a long time to realize that there were people uh, who didn't think that way. Yeah. But that's the way we were brought up. Remember, I don't know if I was telling you that when I was, I mean, I was seven years old, maybe eight years old, and I used to go to the field with my grandmother. And they, the people that owned the field were white, of course. And my grandmother used to go and pick cotton or whatever. And she would be nervous as hell because the the, uh, the sister of the white family that used to live there would come over and talk. And my grandmother would say, well, what did you want? Why did you do that? And I could never figure out why she got so nervous about it because this seemed like a nice lady till the, till, and until then I understood. Mm. Then I understood why she was so nervous. Mm. And I was a kid. Yeah. But I still could have died. I could have been killed. Right. You know, it, it, that's the way it was. That's the way you came up. Yeah. So, Debbie, I mean, a recent one I asked you about, because someone asked me, was about Emmett being put into a pig boil and such. Oh, wow. I mean, I yeah, I, I, I'd heard that one too. And I asked, um, the FBI agent Dale Killinger, if because um, if he had been put in a pig boiler, his body would have shown that. Right. And he said there's nothing to indicate that, and so I, that one doesn't look like it was yeah. anything more than just some rumor that floated around. And I know the person that mentioned it said he heard it from a few different people, but you know rumors can be heard by a few different people and independently can be spreading them around too. So. It, there's no indication. And in fact, it wasn't just there was no indication. He was pretty adamant that Dale, no, I, he, that couldn't have happened. So what other rumors have you, that, that have been dispelled? Well, you know, of course, everything from the Huey story was, you know, that's the stuff that's has stuck for so many years. Right. And that's the stuff that has to be refuted on a regular basis. Um, Emma Till is, in fact, one of the things that Carolyn Bryant told the defense attorneys on September 2nd, 1955, which is, you know, way before the trial, a few weeks before the trial, just a couple days after the kidnapping, was that they brought him to the store that you know, she admitted, you know, to the defense that, yes, um, they kidnapped him, or I don't think she used those words, but said they brought this Negro uh, to, the, to the store for me to identify. He was scared, but he hadn't been hurt, hadn't been harmed. So if he was scared at that point, um, when they were at the store, how's he going to be when they're beating him up and, and doing all this stuff? And he, they, their version was he was defiant to the end and said, they asked him right before they shot him, are you still as good as we are? And he said, yeah. That was Huey's version that came from Milam, I guess. He was clearly scared to death. And I can't imagine what it was, the suffering and, and the fear um, when we see George Floyd calling out for his mother, uh, when he has all these people around him, think how Emmett Till was secluded somewhere in the dark um, and 14 years old, you know, right. he's not standing up to them. And, but they had to preserve that image because again, he was, it showed he was this man, not just a boy, and that he was a acting outside of his place, acting out of line by stepping out of his place. And so those things need to be, you know, th those are just ugly part. I mean, the whole story is ugly, but those are ugly parts that, that people have kept alive because it's a way to somehow justify. Even if subconsciously you're justifying his death, it makes it a little easier for you to bear if he was standing up to them and doing all this stuff. And that's just so wrong, you know. And so, you know, any portrayal of his death cannot portray any of that stuff from Huey like that. Right. And um, that's given many, many people a reason to justify him being killed, yeah. especially after the, that story first came out and people in the South are reading it. Um, 
they, they were able to sleep a little bit better by getting that version. Right. Yeah. So we, we, we've been talking about Emmett and, and one of the central characters uh, is Carolyn Bryant. Um, Cause it's her words, you know, white tears uh, that leads to his death. But there's always been a controversy around what she says and what she didn't say and so forth. And even, even the most recent book um, where supposedly she confesses that, uh, that she lied. But now there's even controversy around that. So what, what's really going on here? Well, it's, on that one, it's so complicated because you know, first of all, did she lie? The answer is yes, but we know that not so much from what Tim Tyson said, she said, you know, 60 plus years later. It's from what she said to the defense attorneys on the day she gave that interview on September 2nd, 1955, and compare that to what she said on the witness stand. That's, it was on the witness stand where Emmett grabs her by the waist and propositions her and says, don't worry, I've been with white women before, and then she struggles to get away. Um, she doesn't say any of that to the attorneys two days after the kidnapping. So that's how we know she lied about that. And we can assume because Mylon and Bryant told Mose Wright, we want the boy who did the talk, that this story was concocted after the, his death for the benefit of the jury, because they, even though she didn't tell it to the jury, they were hoping she would. In fact, she was on the stand and started to tell it, and the judge dismissed the jury. So the defense was hoping to get that, because again, that would have been a black, and she referred to him as a black, as a Negro man, so that would have been a case of a black man attempting to rape a white woman, and that's the version they needed the jury to hear. There's no evidence she was telling that prior to his death, and so his death, I think, the evidence points to his death being based on just him going into the store and whistling and if there was some talk because the men said we want the boy that did that talk um as far as the whistle i know some people have said have may have made this assumption that when she confessed to tim tyson that she lied that she lied about everything but it was Emma Till's cousins who told the press about the whistle. You know, from the day of the um, kidnapping until the trial, every statement about the whistle that came in the papers, that made its way to the papers, and it was known as the Wolf Whistle trial at that point, Wolf Whistle murder, that all came from Emma's cousins because she didn't say a public word about the, the whistle until the trial, but his cousins were telling that to the press a lot. So the whistle wasn't her story to make up because it didn't originate with her. She did verify it, but that, so that's an important one. I mean, he did whistle, but he didn't do really anything beyond that from what the evidence shows. Um, and uh, as far as what she, you know, so she did lie, but whether she told that lie to, Steve, to Tim Tyson or not, that's been the, uh, the controversy lately because he didn't record that portion of his interview and uh, his notes that he turned over to the FBI are just scratched out on a small portion of a legal pad but he formulated some lengthy quotes from that that he put in a in an article in a, in a, in a essay he wrote that he never published that leaked that I got a copy of and he walks a lot of that back, or at least tones it down for his book. And some of that was good stuff that in his article, he said that Carolyn Bryant and the, and the family sat down with the defense attorneys and concocted this story. Well, he doesn't put that in the book. Um, and I think that's a bombshell that you wouldn't pull back from the book, that you would just put in a, in a, in a paper for your grad students. And so things like that make me wonder if he made it up or exaggerated it because she's denying she told him that. And if you read, and, and to say it was a confession, it makes it sound like she came to him and said, I gotta get this off my chest, I made this up. It was just casually, even if you accept his version, it was just casually mentioned in like a, just a few words where she said, you, 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 you tell these stories for so long, 
that you can't remember what's true, but that part is not true. That's right. all he said. Yeah. So it wasn't and something. He didn't even record it audio wise. And he didn't even record it. And so whether he got that from the, her original 1955 story where it was clear she changed her story and he wanted to use that to sell a book. And I'm not accusing him of that here right. just in case he wants to sue or something as a result of this today. But I, I, I know that some of the stuff the FBI was looking into. So until they conclude something there, there's just some layers of controversy about his interactions with her right. that you don't know what's true and what isn't. But it boils down to she did lie about him attempting to rape her. Right. You know, that part is a lie, whether it came from whether she told it to Tim Tyson or not. Right. And so and, and, and the issue, particularly for Carolyn, then becomes is that there's not a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, statue of limitation for lying on the stand. That there's not. Right. See that I don't know. I see. I know that my, it, my, under, my that's my understanding is that you know part part of the issue is is that you you can actually still prosecute her for actually lying on the stand if that's the case, and that's why when the book came out saying that she was you know that she was recanting that that she turned around and said well well wait a second no Tim you know Timothy's lying uh, I didn't say that at all he's making that stuff up what I said uh, was true and on that one I wasn't sure because I know that when they uh tried to indict her in 2007 it was for manslaughter right um you know that not that she was present during the murder but she didn't for manslaughter charges you don't have to be you just have to aid them like either steer them towards somebody or that and because she uh told you know there was evidence that she told her husband and milam that he was the right one and weeded out a couple of other young men earlier that day that they he wasn't the right one Right. But that was how she um, aided them. And, and I know there was precedent. They, they, they were able to point to some other cases. So that was the, that's kind of what they used for that. But the, the, a biracial grand jury just said that there wasn't enough evidence. So and what you're referring to, by the way, is, is, is if, correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, Mo's rights testifies that, um, that there was, they took Emmett Till to the car or to the truck and asked, is this him? And he hears a soft voice that says, yes. And it was too dark for him to see. And so all he went by was the voice, but you know, then people say, well, who else could it have been? Right. And then earlier in the day, they were driving around picking up, you know, African-Americans and is this him? No. And then I think there's one person who said that, uh, well, whose teeth were broken because they threw him out of the car while it was moving and it busted all his teeth. Yeah, and there was another case where a, 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 a young boy and his grandmother came into the Bryant store, right. and Roy went up to him and said, are you the one that did this? And he, the kid didn't know what he was talking about. And Carolyn said, no, no, that's not the right one. It's interesting because the FBI interviewed the kid, and as an adult in 2005, and Carolyn backed up that story. She remembered that. So that one they had evidence for. The other that the kid, they, the guy they threw out of the car, they only had uh, that guy's word. There's no reason to doubt it, but they were able to at least trace the one back from the very beginning. You know, they had some verifying testimony. So they had that to strengthen that she aided and abetted them. Uh, but a grand jury didn't see it that way. At least they didn't think the evidence was strong enough. So I wasn't sure now if with what the Tyson book, if right. that was to strengthen the manslaughter charge or they were just going to try to get her for perjuring herself on the stand. Because I thought the statute of limitations would have run out, but I don't know the law. Well, you know, that could be wrong. I'm not an attorney either, but that, that's, that's what I understood. It. But there's one other thing as well is that uh, her sister-in-law, J.W. Milam's wife, uh, she told the FBI that she wasn't there when she screamed, you know, that supposed, so Carolyn claims that she screamed out you know, so she screamed when, 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 you know, Emmett Till grabs her. And in one instance, her sister-in-law says, well, I wasn't even there. In the other instance, she says, I never heard any scream. Yeah. Well, as far as a scream, if she'd screamed, you got to remember the front doors would have been open with a, to the store with the screen door shut to keep mosquitoes out. But it was right. so Wheeler and his cousins. They never heard anything either. They didn't hear anything like that. Um, so that sounds like she made that up. 
as far as Juanita Milan being there, she, it was in, not until 2005 that she um, told the FBI she wasn't there. So as far as what she said back in the day, I, I know in 2005 she said she thought she was in Greenville that night. That's where she was from, and her mom and dad lived there. When she talked to the defense attorneys in 1955, around the same time Carolyn did, she doesn't address being at the store. She just said she was in Greenwood the night of the kidnapping. So I think possibly 50, you know, some years later when she's interviewed, she is confusing the night of the kidnapping with the night of the store incident. And the reason I think that is because it was her car that was there at the store that, because the Bryans didn't own a car. Her And, and, and the way Carolyn described it was that she went out to Carolyn's, to Juanita's car to get this gun. Well, the witnesses said she went out to a car to get a gun too. So if Juanita Milam's car was there, it seemed, and JW wasn't there, because they didn't know about this yet, or they had gone and killed him until that night. Um, seems that Juanita either forgot she was there or wanted to distance herself from to the FBI from the whole story saying, hey, I wasn't around for any of this. Because you know, I'm sure she was worried she might be yeah, prosecuted well, too. Then, then on top of that, um, so Carolyn, I think she, Carolyn tells the, uh, the FBI agent that Dale, is that right? Dale, yeah. Um, that when Wheeler or, or whomever, whichever the cousins went in to, gra to grab Emmett to bring him out, that she said, I have no idea why he, why they came in to get him. It was as if, like, you know, well, why why would they had to why did they have to come in even though all this stuff was going on, and again they were by they were by the door so they were kind of keeping an eye on them and they even said that nothing even happened when they were exchanging the money because she says that you know he grabbed her by the wrist, and they, they're, in the FBI files at least there's you know, the, the conversation is that there was nothing that actually took place. 